Good day, I am Dr. Hannah de Guzman, and I will be talking about one of the essential aspects of the ophthalmic examination, which is the evaluation of the optic nerve head. I am a member of the Philippine Glaucoma Society and a glaucoma consultant at a few hospitals. I have no financial interest in any of the equipment mentioned or shown in this talk. Why do we need to examine the optic nerve? Well, this is where the damage caused by glaucoma is most visible. The optic nerve is a bundle of the axons of all of the retinal ganglion cells as they pass through on their way to the brain. The bundled axons form the yellow-orange neuroretinal rim, and the extra space is seen as the pale optic cup. As the RGCs die off in glaucoma, they undergo apoptosis. Their axons disappear from the disc, and the fewer remaining axons occupy a smaller space, hence the thinning of the rim with corresponding enlargement of the cup. So remember that it's the rim that is important, not the cup. These are what we want to find out when we examine the optic nerve. Naturally, we examine the optic nerve at the initial visit, but we also need to check at every follow-up visit because there can be changes that occur overnight. I will talk about these later on. The gold standard for examining the optic nerve is stereoscopic examination using a slit lamp and a fundus lens, such as a 60, 78, or 90 diopter lens. We might need to dilate the patient's pupils after first checking with our gonia lens that it's safe to do that. A direct ophthalmoscope is not recommended because of the monocular view. What do we look for when examining the optic nerve? That is the main topic of this talk. First, we need to learn to distinguish normal from abnormal. But to do that, we need to know what normal looks like. So what is normal? Well, people can be very different from each other in appearance. And the same can be said of the optic disc. These eight discs are all healthy with no glaucoma, and yet they vary quite a lot in their appearance. So we need to keep in mind that normal can take on many forms. It is only by familiarizing ourselves with the many variations of normal that we will be able to reliably identify abnormal discs. These are the features of a typical, not normal, disc. We will go through them one by one. The first disc feature is size. The average disc has a diameter of 1.7 to 1.8 millimeters vertically, but this can vary quite a lot. In fact, it's probably the disc feature that varies the most. There's the average size disc, then there are the small and large discs, and the extra large ones that in my mind I like to call jumbo discs. Discs that are even smaller than the small one here might actually already be considered hypoplastic discs. The next disc feature is shape. The typical Filipino disc is slightly vertically oval with a horizontally oval cup. But discs can come in other shapes and yet still be normal. And the shape of the cup tends to follow the shape of the disc. We may have been taught that a vertically oval cup indicates glaucoma due to the thinning of the neuroretinal rim at the superior and inferior poles of the disc, but we need to take the shape of the disc into consideration. The next disc feature is the ISNT rule. The ISNT rule states that the thickness of the inferior rim is greater than or equal to that of the superior rim, which is greater than or equal to that of the nasal rim, which in turn is greater than or equal to that of the temporal rim. Remember what I said earlier, that it is the rim that is important, so that is what we need to look at. Here is where we might safely use the word normal. The normal disc has a yellow-orange neuroretinal rim. The color is also sometimes described as pinkish-yellow. Any color other than that is not normal. So in glaucoma, the neuroretinal rim retains its color despite getting thinner. If the rim is pale, a different type of damage has affected that nerve. This is not to say that glaucomatous discs don't develop 
pale rims. Eyes that have experienced an episode or episodes of extremely high IOP can sometimes develop disc pallor weeks to months after the event. But we need to take the ocular media into consideration when evaluating rim color. This patient is pseudophagic in the right eye and has a mild cataract in the left eye which gives everything a yellowish tinge. If you did not know that, you might think that the right disc is slightly pale. Most people have similar looking optic nerve heads in the two eyes. We have been taught that asymmetry in the cup to disc ratio is a sign of glaucoma. This is true, but only if the discs are the same size. Asymmetry in disc size is easy to spot when looking at side-by-side -side photos like we are doing now, but it's a lot harder when we are looking at one eye at a time. This example is quite obvious. Later, I will be explaining methods for estimating or measuring the disc size while examining the patient. In this example, the difference is less obvious than in the previous slide. We can see the difference better when I put these reference circles. In this case, the difference is very subtle, and yet, it might be enough to fool us into thinking that the left disc might have glaucoma while the right one does not. There is also a typical vessel pattern. Typically, the central retinal vein and artery emerge just nasal to the center of the disc. But, as with most of the features that we've discussed so far, there are many normal discs that do not quite look like that. You may have been taught that nasalization of the vessels is an indicator of glaucoma. That is only true some of the time. So far, I've been talking about disc features. Although the retinal nerve fiber layer is not strictly part of the disc, examination of the RNFL is an integral part of the examination of the optic nerve head. The RNFL is seen as refractile striations extending radially from the disc. It is thickest and most visible superior and inferior to the disc, which corresponds to the relatively thicker superior and inferior neuroretinal rims. The thicker it is, the more it obscures the retinal vessels. This appearance of the RNFL is called a reflex. The OCT RNFL thickness map on the right shows the normal thickness distribution of the RNFL. Warmer colors indicate thicker RNFL. So what we have learned so far is that normal discs can look very different from each other. Thus, we need to keep looking at our patient's discs so that we learn what normal looks like. So now we come to the next step, abnormal discs. Hopefully, in the last few minutes, we have gained some insight into what normal discs look like so that we can start to learn what glaucoma does to the optic disc. These are seven important features that we need to look at when evaluating a disc for glaucoma. The various optic nerve head signs that we might see vary in their significance. From this point on, stars on the slide will indicate the relative strength of that sign as an indicator of glaucoma. First, we need to consider disc size. The disc size is our reference point from which we will evaluate the rest of the disc. A large disc will naturally have a large cup. A small disc should have a small cup or the cup could even be absent. All that is needed is enough space for the 1 to 1.2 million RGC axons. So a large cup can indicate that part of the rim has been lost or that there is simply a lot of extra space in the disc. It all depends on the size of the disc. Here we see evidence that smaller discs have smaller cup to disc ratios and larger discs have larger ones. Since the average vertical disc diameter is 1.7 to 1.8 millimeters, then the average cup to disc ratio should be 0.45 to 0.5. I cannot stress enough the importance of the disc size when talking of the CD ratio. The most precise way of measuring the disc diameter at the slit lamp is by using a reticule that attaches to the fundus lens. 
but this is an extra piece of equipment that most of us don't have and can be quite hard to find. We can estimate the disk size without any extra equipment by simply measuring the disk diameter using the height of the slit beam and multiplying that measurement by the magnification factor of our fundus lens. Take note that fundus lenses of the same dioptric power can have different magnification factors. For example, the Volk Superfield 78 diopter lens has an image magnification of 0.77x, but a standard 78 diopter lens has an image magnification of 1x. Keep in mind that this method only gives an estimate of the disk size because it is affected by factors such as the patient's error of refraction or HL length. To spare myself from doing multiplication every time I examine a patient, I made a quick reference guide and attached it to my lens case. With enough practice, we can learn to estimate the disc size using clues such as the caliber of the retinal veins as they exit the disc. There is not much individual variation in retinal vein caliber, so it is fairly reliable as a reference point for estimating disc size. However, this usefulness decreases in advanced posterior pole disease, including advanced glaucoma. Another way of measuring disc size is by using imaging technology. Some disc imaging machines provide this value automatically, while others rely on the technician to plot the disc edges first. Regardless of how it was done, we need to check if the disc border was correctly identified before accepting the disc size measurements. The second feature to examine is the neuroretinal rim. The typical disc has a horizontally oval cup because of the naturally thicker superior and inferior rims. Glaucoma damage starts at the superior and inferior rims, causing the previously horizontally oval cup to become vertically oval, as you can see in the photo on the right. The neuroretinal rim is bounded by the scleral ring and the cup edge. The cup edge can usually be identified by the bending of the vessels as they hug the neuroretinal rim. However, there are discs with vessels that do not bend with the rim. Another difficulty when identifying the cup edge is in discs with sloping rims, such as the disc on the right. In contrast, the disc on the left has a well-defined cup edge. There can also be difficulties identifying the rim coming from the other side. People of pigmented races sometimes have a crescent-shaped gray discoloration on the outer edge of the neuroretinal rim, usually located temporally or inferotemporally. If the gray part is mistaken as being not part of the rim, the disc can be falsely labeled as glaucomatous. In this slide, the correctly identified disc edge is on the left. In this example, the correctly identified disc border is on the left. Peripapillary atrophy can also confound the identification of the outer disc border. In this glaucomatous disc, the exposed scleral ring can be mistaken as being part of the rim. The junction of the exposed scleral ring and the hyperpigmented peripapillary atrophy can be mistaken as the disc border. In this slide, the correctly identified disc border is on the left. In this case of well-demarcated and smooth-edged peripapillary atrophy, one could mistake the peripapillary atrophy for a gray crescent, leading to the conclusion that the rim is wider than it actually is. The correctly identified disc border is on the left. The easiest glaucomatous sign to check for in the neuroretinal rim is violation of the isn't rule. The rim is usually thickest inferiorly and thinnest temporally. This extends to the peripapillary RNFL, which is why the RNFL forms a double hump pattern as measured using the various imaging technologies. Here, the isn't rule is highlighted in this normal disc. When the isn't rule is violated, such as in the glaucomatous disc on the right, that is a two-star indicator of glaucoma. Here you see that it is the nasal rim and not the inferior rim that is the thickest. Focal thinning of the neuroretinal rim is a strong indicator of glaucoma. A very sharp area of focal thinning of the rim is called a notch, 
and is a three-star indicator of glaucoma. Thinning of any part of the neuroretinal rim, including the nasal rim, is a three-star indicator of glaucoma. But we need to keep in mind that rim loss does not only develop radially. Anterior posterior rim thinning also occurs and can sometimes be seen before radial thinning. Anterior posterior rim thinning is almost impossible to see without stereoscopic viewing of the disc. It is often quite subtle. Most times, the first and only clue is a slight lightening of the color of the rim that is not exactly pallor. It's easier to appreciate in the small full discs that neuro-ophthalmologists call disc at risk. Pallor of the optic cup is normal. Pallor of any part of the rim is more likely to be a sign of non-glaucomatous optic nerve damage. Pallor can be diffuse or focal. The case on the right is scarce hereditary optic neuropathy. The appearance of the disc on the left is nonspecific and can occur with a variety of neuroophthalmic conditions. The vessels can also show signs of glaucomatous change. When blood vessels appear to undercut the scleral ring before exiting the deepened cup, it is called bayonetting of the vessels. This is a two-star indicator of glaucoma. Bayonetting can affect multiple blood vessels, as in these examples. When the glaucoma is so severe that the neuroretinal rim has undercut the scleral ring in all sectors of the disc, this is what is known as a beanpot disc. This is usually accompanied by bayonetting of multiple vessels. Nasalization of the blood vessels is only a weak indicator of glaucoma, because even normal discs can show nasalization. Circumlinear vessels are small vessels that curve along the rim. When the rim has receded, but the vessels remain in place, an area of pallor appears between the vessel and the rim. This is called bearing of the circumlinear vessels. Optociliary shunt vessels are dilated, tortuous collateral vessels that can occur in many disease conditions. As a diagnostic indicator, disc hemorrhages are only a two-star indicator of glaucoma, but when they are seen in established cases of glaucoma, they are a strong predictor of progression. I mentioned earlier that we need to examine the disc at every visit. Rim thinning will not progress overnight, but disc hemorrhages can suddenly appear. Sometimes they are very obvious, but more often than not, they are very subtle. Because of this, we need to be very thorough when examining the disc. Disc hemorrhages are eventually resorbed, sometimes leaving behind a thinner rim, a new RNFL defect, or a new visual field defect. The RNFL follows a specific anatomic pattern. Here is a larger image for us to appreciate what the healthy RNFL looks like. Here are two more examples of healthy RNFL. Diffuse loss of the RNFL is a strong indicator of glaucoma. However, it can be difficult to detect, especially in older individuals, in those with hazy ocular media, and in those with a tigroid fundus. One clue is the bearing of the retinal vessels. See how sharp the edges of the retinal vessels appear in the photo on the right with diffuse RNFL loss. Compare this with the slightly obscured retinal vessels of the healthy eye on the left. Focal RNFL loss is more noticeable than diffuse loss, but it can still be difficult to detect. Focal RNFL defects are also a strong indicator of glaucoma. They are easier to see using red-free filters. Here is another example of a focal RNFL defect. In this example, there are multiple RNFL defects. Pigmentary changes in the peripapillary area are called peripapillary atrophy. Alpha peripapillary atrophy is nonspecific. Here is another example of alpha peripapillary atrophy. Beta peripapillary atrophy, on the other hand, is a weak indicator of glaucoma. However, when the 
PPA is located nasally, it doesn't matter whether it's alpha or beta. The lamina cribrosa is another feature we need to examine. Laminar dots or pores are sometimes visible in normal discs. In these cases, they are usually round. But when the laminar dots are oval or slit-like, it may be an indicator of glaucoma. Slit-like laminar dots tend to be associated with backward bowing of the lamina cribrosa. In summary, glaucomatous disc features include those listed on the slide. But we need to remember the qualifiers of each feature. Cup to disc ratio depends on the disc size. Rim thinning and violation of the isn't rule depend on the baseline cup shape and disc shape. Vessel changes vary in strength as indicators of glaucoma, and changes can be seen in the RNFL, the peripapillary area, and the lamina cribrosa. The more signs that are present, the higher the likelihood of glaucoma. When multiple signs are present in the same area, the diagnosis is practically guaranteed. Now that we have learned how to identify glaucomatous discs, the next steps are to correlate the disc findings with the clinical picture and to monitor for progression. Regular examination of the discs, preferably with photographic documentation, will help us detect progression. Thanks for watching.